Sunday. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Auction for the Soul. This week's Pasha is Pasha Tetzaveh. And uh, this week's Pasha of Learning is dedicated by the Daniel S. Loeb Torah Center, the Diamond Donors, Tatiana and Sonny Dewar, in loving memory of Lui Nishmat, Sonny's father, Eli Dewar, Eliyahu, Ben Sion, Fareda. Allah shalom. May the Neshama have an Aliyah. Okay, uh, you were not here on the recording earlier, but I became a grandpa. And I can tell you that uh, there is nothing more... Uh, you know, uh, meaningful than um, meeting a grandchild. Um, those of you that have grandchildren know exactly what I'm talking about. The first ones, you never forget the first ones. Um, there's this this overwhelming emotion that swells in your heart, a feeling of pride, of, of gratitude, of a of an unearned, undeserving gift almost that, um, you know, especially since October 7th, I felt like, I feel for all of us, the world has changed in so many ways, yeah. uh, the way we think yeah. about life, the way we think about family, community. Uh, before I forget, may Hashem protect our chayalim fighting for us on the borders and in Israel and around the world. May our hostages be returned safely soon. May this war come to a very, very abrupt end and let us live in a world of simcha and bracha because ultimately that's what God created. Hashem created a world which was supposed to be a world where we see and recognize the unique beauty in every single human being. Of course, I see it in my granddaughter. She's perfect, right? She's a little bundle of joy. She's five pounds and uh, 13 ounces, I think. Um, and a uh, small little girl. God willing, one day, <clears throat> my mother, who you know, I called right afterwards, she's like, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a great grandmother. I'm like, yeah, you're a great grandmother. She's like, oh my God, I'm so happy it's a girl. I'm like, me too, but why are you happy? She's like, I'm so happy because it means that she'll be getting married sooner than if it was a boy so I can meet my great, great grandkid. So I'm like, oh, okay. I was just thinking about no pressure, no brit milah, just slowly easing into, yeah. you know, a grandparenthood and not have to rush and do all the things you need for a bigger simcha. But anyway, okay, so enough about that, enough about me. Let's talk, let's talk Torah. Okay, so uh, this week's Pasha is Pashat Tetzaveh. And it is a, like all parashiyot in the Torah, you know, it could either be super clear, explicit, this is exactly what the parasha wants. Although I find that most of the time, the Torah itself is always trying to, you know, teach you things on, on a three-dimensional level. And in order for us to appreciate, you know, what the Torah is often, you know, uh, trying to impart, you have to think more deeply. And you have to ask lots of great questions. So the first thing that stands out in this parasha is exactly how the Torah begins. Pasha begins with Va'ata Tetzave et Bene Yisrael. You shall command the children of Am Yisrael. And the question is, well, what happened to the guy we, you and I have been hearing about up until now? There's been one character since uh, we met him in the beginning of Pasha Shemot. Okay, we've heard about him every single Pasha. Whenever God is speaking, Vayda Hashem El Moshe. He's speaking to Moshe. And curiously, we hear, you're all familiar with this idea, Moshe is missing. The word Moshe does not come out once in the parasha. And you know the answer. You're going to tell me, of course, Rabbi, because Moshe is going to tell God, I want you to erase me from your book. And this happens later in the Torah. Parasha Kitisa, where Moshe and, um, is, uh, is trying to defend Am Yisrael from uh, Hashem wiping out the Jewish people. And Moshe threatens God and says, you know what? Wipe me off. I don't want to be part of your book. Take me off. If you're going to take destroy the Jewish people, then everything I've done is for naught. Just get rid of me. So um, anything that a tzaddik says has to have its expression in reality at some point. And therefore, because Moshe said, erase me, delete me from your book, some element of that has to become true. So the question is, well, okay, I get that. That makes sense. Well, then why here? Parashat Tetzaveh, is a, a several parashiyot before Kitisa. Why now? Why is it happening here? Um, and there's lots of great answers to this question. There's two in particular that I want to deal with. One is the Benish Chai. <clears throat> Rav Yosef Chaim Baghdad said that the reason why it's Vedaka this week's parasha, Pasha Tetzaveh, is exactly the 20th parasha from the beginning of Breshit. You can't Breshit all the way until Pasha Tetzaveh, exactly 20 parashiyot. And he says, when Moshe said, Misifrecha, he says, read it like this. He's like, Tancheni, erase me, Misefer Chaf. From the 20th book, Ben Yishchai points out. Misifrecha, take out Misefer Chaf. The 20th parasha, and that's why Pasha Tetzaveh, he's not there. 
Okay, so fulfilling exactly what that Siddiq said, and so on and so forth. But I think there's a deeper uh, expression, uh, a deeper, uh, higher level of truth that uh, we are supposed to walk away with from this week's Pasha. So let's keep going. Pasuk says like this, I want you to command the Jewish people, they should take pure olive oil, they want you to crush the olive oil for lighting, so you could go ahead and light the lights, lalot ner tamid, an eternal flame. Okay? <clears throat> so, it's a curious pasuk over here. You know, uh, why does the pasuk, where we don't see Moshe's name appear, okay, somehow linked to this concept of, you know, crushing olives, uh, you know, to kindle lamps continuously? What is, the, is there a correlation here between the two? And I'm going to argue, of course, that there is. So, first of all, we know that from the Gemara and Menachot, there are nine different levels of quality of olive oil. Now, it's interesting, you know, this is a side point, I think this is interesting, you know, that olives is the, um, when you squeeze an olive, it's not like other kinds of fruits. When you squeeze an apple, what do you get? That's right, you get apple juice. When you squeeze an orange, what do you get? Orange juice. Grapefruit, grapefruit juice. Pomegranate, pomegranate juice. What happens when you squeeze an olive? What do we call that? Oil. What happens when you squeeze a grape? What do you get? Not grape juice. <laughs> you get you get wine, right? It's a little different, okay? So it's interesting that these two particular, um, you know, uh, fruit have special unique brachot in them because when you crush them, they turn it, they, they create something even greater than whatever value was there before. Olive oil or oil has more value than the olive for so many people, okay? The wine has more value than the actual grape itself. So you have something special over here about taking something, crushing it, and making it something more. This, I believe, is very much at the core of what Torah and what Hashem wants from us. You know, if you looked in ancient times and you were to uh, ask, what was the uh, ancient w um, symbol for wisdom in the Greeks? You know what it was? It was, the, it was the olive branch. That's right, the olive reef, actually. The Caesar would wear it around his head, right? That was an olive branch. Right, and the olive itself was a tremendous uh, icon of all kinds of you know ideations within, within the Greeks. It was a perfect superfruit. They ate it. They had it with everything. Olive, the olive, the Greek olive is famous. Okay, but, and for Jews, if you were to pick a symbol of Jewish wisdom, what would it be? Anyone know? The symbol for Jewish wisdom is the menorah. At the core, what fuels menorah is something called olive oil. Shemen zayit zach this very special pure oil, okay? Um, the oil is what's important. And this dichotomy is one that you and I are still dealing with today. What's the dichotomy? What is the difference? You and I can see a material world and it's all about the physical, the things that are tangible. But in reality, there's a deeper truth over here, a truth that is uh, beyond, uh, you know, uh, something that you, can, you and I can touch and feel and see. Just we believe in spirituality. And in the same way that we, as Jews, look at the physical world, we recognize that the physical world is hiding something unique inside of it. There's potential there. How do I get to that potential? I take the olive, I smush it, I crush it, I crush it, and I pull out this Sheben Zayed Zach, right, this special high level of pure, the purest type of virgin olive oil, okay? And, um, and I use that and I elevate it from something that is just physical into something that now creates light. Light gives me wisdom, it gives me knowledge. I could, in a dark room, the light turns on, I can see where I'm going. I have power, I have heat. I have all sorts of things. By transcending the material, by working and using the material world, I get to a higher expression of truth in a spiritual plane. And that, I believe, is what is happening in this Pasha. Hashem says, Vata, you. Who is he talking to? Moshe is talking, Hashem is talking to Moshe. Which part of Moshe? Chachamim tell us that Hashem over here is speaking to his neshama. There's not, there's not, there's, it's not that we're seeing less of Moshe, they say. Just because his name is not here doesn't mean that he's not present. The opposite. There's a truer expression of who each of us are that has not yet expressed itself in this world because we're too distracted by the material world. We're too, you know, uh, lost in uh, trying to figure out what our real identity is. Are you a body with a soul or are you a soul with a body? You choose. And it's so easy to look at the Torah and say, oh, wow, you know, 
this is what success looks like. But I want you to know the only place in the world where success comes before work is in the dictionary. Any other place you're gonna see a success, okay? Work comes first. A lot of work comes first. And I believe that's what this idea is. What, who is Hashem talking to Moshe? Moshe represents the light. He represents greatness. He represents the highest expression of a man in this world. Highest level of connection to God. Okay, there's no one, there will never be a man like Moshe, nothing like Moshe ever. Okay, so the Pasha is telling us, Ve'ata. Now, who? Ata is talking to whom? Is talking to Moshe's inner greatest self. Ve'ata tetzave b'nei Israel. I don't want Moshe Rabbeinu to talk to Am Yisrael. This point of you going ahead and bringing and doing the avodah, which seems like such a mundane material thing. What do they do in the Beit HaMikdash all day? They're cleaning out light bulbs. You know, they're taking out ash from the, uh, from the menorah. They're, they're, they're burning korbanot. No, Hashem says. At the core, I want you to be mindful that the whole entire avodah is what? La'alot ner tamid. Do you think that Hashem in this pasuk is talking about a, a regular uh, light? Or he's talking about something greater? What, what, what is Hashem's candle called? Right? Nishmat Hashem, the Nishmat Adam Ne'er Hashem. Pasuk says that God's candle is man's soul. And therefore, this Pasuk over here, where Hashem is telling, commanding Moshe, his honest, deeper, deeper self, he's saying, you know what? I want you to use the highest expression of who you are to remind the world that the whole purpose, the function of the world that you and I are living in is to elevate it from something that is mundane into something that is eternal. The only thing that is eternal in this world is our soul. In 10,000 years from now, no one will remember who we are. <laughs> it's all going to be gone. Okay, it's all over. Okay, but there is something that is beyond space and time, and that is our soul. How do you and I work on our soul? There's only one way to develop your soul. It has to do with you giving of yourself. It has to do with a little bit of self-sacrifice. It has to do with having a vision for what it means to be the best version of who you are. It means to have a plan about where you want to go, what you want to tackle, who do you want to be, where are you going? If you're standing still, you ain't going nowhere. You gotta be growing like a candle, like a light is always reaching higher and higher and higher. It doesn't stop until it exhausts every single ounce of fluid. And that's what it means to be a Jew at our core. The world doesn't understand us. They've never understood us. And we are so lucky that you and I and the people that are here listening, we were born at a time of relative peace after World War II until now, wow, a best time in, in all of world history to be a Jew. I'd say barring First Temple era. This last 75 years were an amazing run. And it's changing. UCLA students just signed the BDS petition to go ahead and block Israel. Absolutely insane. And you're seeing more and more millennials, I think something like 50% of all millennials don't believe that Jews belong in Israel, which is a crazy thought on its own. And I don't know where politics will be in this country in 20, 25 years from now. All I know is the world is changing very quickly. And the difference is as follows. You know, my, um, my wife, um, her, her grandparents on the mom's side were Holocaust survivors. And uh, her uh, grandfather and her grandmother moved to Ohio. And he was a shochet in uh, Europe. And when he came to America, he opened up like a, a meat business. And he had a lot of goyim working for him, who were like experts from Europe coming who knew how to cut cows and so on and so forth. So um, one of the little workers, who's a Polish guy, says to my wife's aunt, this is my mom's sister, she was a teenager, and said, you know, your father, Jake, wow, what a guy. You know, we're so happy that the Nazis didn't kill him. But the rest, you know, whatever. Like, you know, he was just made like a joke. Can you like, you know, like it's, we're, we're so lucky that they didn't kill him, but like, you know, they're Jewish, what do you expect? And she was horrified by this. Like, how do you, like, she told her father, like, dad, like, you gotta get rid, you gotta fire him. You can't have this guy work. He's an anti-Semite. You can't have this guy working here. He basically said that all the Jews, he understands why they were killed, but Jake, we could make an exception for him, right? So her, listen to this. This is, this is a, 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 I heard the story um, a, few, a few months ago for when my, my son Akiva just got married. She was at her house. She told us the story. I heard her say this. I was like, dumb time. Let's, let's listen to his response. Holocaust survivor. You know what he says to her? He says to her, you know, if I had to fire... Uh, him for being an anti-Semite, I have to fire the world. That was his attitude. Like, it never changed for him. He living in America, like he, you and I, 
we're duped into the material comfort that you and I had where everything is great and, and, and that's not the reality anymore. God creates a reality where he wants one thing. He wants humanity to work towards excellence and greatness. And there's two ways you and I are gonna grow. Either through choice, which is all of you are doing right now by listening to this. You've chosen to spend time and listening to something that hopefully, I hope, somehow elevates you, inspires you to do a little bit more, okay? Or circumstance. Circumstance, painful. Circumstance is really, really difficult. Circumstance is uncomfortable. Choice is also uncomfortable, but at least you're choosing to grow. And I'm, I'm confident of this. You could either live your life walking through it and allowing things to happen versus you choosing to living a life where you are making your life happen. And that's what God wants from us. That's what this pasuk is. Moshe, I want the deepest part of who you are. I want you to remember you're a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. I want you to talk to the Jewish people. And I want you to tell them, Shem and Zayed Zach, it's not about the olive. I want the shem and the stuff inside katik that you crushed. The part of you inside is where the real beauty is. That's the part of you that has so much to give and to inspire the world with. That is la'alot ner tamid. I want you, that's going to last forever. You want immortality, my friends? It's in this pasuk. Moshe was never erased. Okay? He is interested, Hashem is interested in doing one thing. He wants you to live in a world of greatness. But if you and I are not willing to fight for greatness... If we're not willing to uh, push ourselves beyond the comfort zones that you and I live in, he'll have to force circumstances that are very uncomfortable for us. And I don't want that. You know, I, I have mixed feelings when I'm holding my granddaughter. On the one hand, I'm like the happiest man in the world. Like, whoa, like I'm on cloud nine. Uh, the, uh, but on the other hand, I'm terrified. You know, like this weird, like, oh my God, like what kind of a world am I leading here for her? And I know that I don't have the ability of um, changing everything on the planet, but I do have the ability on looking within myself. I have the ability of asking myself, who do I want to be? Where is my ratzon pointing? And I think this idea is something that we forget as we get older. As we get older, we get very comfortable in patterns. And um, we, we don't want to challenge ourselves. And that's a mistake. That's part of what it means to get old. But if you want to be like me and be young at heart, if you want to be like me and you don't want to really get old, what, what really matters is what's happening on the inside, not on the outside. That's the core. That's who you are. I, I just feel like I'm still 20 years old. But I'm, I'm, I, I've entered into the, uh, the special elite club of called grandparents. I'm the Goa Saba. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we, um, I, I realize that, you know, now more than ever in this climate, in this world, I need to work on being a better version of myself. And that I hope in, um, in me trying to work on this expression of greatness and excellence on my part, that that has a trickle-down effect, that, that that has the ability of impacting my family, has the, impact of, uh, the, the ability of impacting my community. It has the ability of hopefully impacting the world. But where do you got to go to become a ner tamid? You got to go within yourselves. Don't start a big organization right now. That's a distraction, right? Va'ata. What does it mean to be you? Who are you at your core? Not when you're with other people. Not when you're, when, you're, when you're projecting an identity when you come to synagogue, you want to be known as that guy or that woman. Who are you when you're alone with your thoughts? Who are you at the core of your essence and your being? So you could often surrender and say, well, you know what? This is where my life has taken me. This is who I am. Right? And feel stuck. But this is a mistake. Okay, I'm going to end off with this, this last idea, which is a powerful idea I saw last week that is very relevant because today, tonight is Purim Katan. Okay, today is Adar Aleph, and tonight is Purim, and uh, tonight's a special day. We know that Purim is like, a, Purim is, a, is like, Yom, Yom Kippur is like Purim. Okay, so Purim is a very holy day in Judaism because it has to do with God revealing himself in a, in a, in a natural way where we see God lift the veil for a little bit and we get to see his, his hand through nature and how that impacts our lives. When um, uh, Mordechai was asked to go and rally the Jewish people, it says, Vayavor Mordechai. And the pasuk over there, the Gemara actually says, and on that pasuk, the word Vayavor is an interesting word, because the word Vayavor always can also mean over. And he's over on doing an Avera. 
And the question is, well, what Ave Arad did he did? Gemara and, and uh, Megillah says that, you know what Mordecai did? He made the fast on, on uh, the first night of Pesach. And you have a choice. You're supposed to have a Sudan Pesach, and then go ahead, uh, Mordecai went ahead, and he made a fast day. Therefore, he was punished, he made a sin uh, by causing all the Jewish people to fast on Pesach. That's one opinion. Another opinion says that the word Vayavor in the Gemara uh, means that um, Mordechai crossed the river. There's a place called Shushan and Shushan Habira. And Mordechai lived in Shushan Habira. Shushan Habira was the capital city of uh, Persia. And Shushan is where all the Jews lived. And he was the only Jew, Ish Yehudi, that lived in Shushan Habira alone. He was the only Jew there. And he had to cross the river. And therefore the, pas- the Pasuk is telling us, Vayavor, he went over to cross the river to rally the Jews. And wow, he had to cross the river to get there. But there's a third opinion, my favorite opinion, that says the word Vayavor means he crossed a puddle. <coughs> And you and I are thinking like, well, who cares about a guy crossing a puddle? He walked over a puddle. What's the big deal? Right? And this is, this is, this is the depth and the beauty of Judaism. Ready? Hashem doesn't care what you crossed. He cares about your ratzon. Where do you want to be? Right? He, wants, he wants to ask you, where do you want to be? Where are you, where are you going? Well, Rabbi, it's too hard for me. I don't know if I'm ready to be Shomer Shabbat. That's okay. Um, you don't want to be Shomer Shabbat? Totally fine. But where, is your heart? where do you want to be? You're stuck. I get it. You could be stuck. Where does your heart want to be? Hashem is judging us based on our ratzon. Lo alecha ligmor hadavar. You are not here to finish things. Right? You are here to build and do. You are here to go ahead and take the material world, crush it, and make something powerfully profound out of it. This happens through our choices. Hashem is saying, I'm commanding you. I want you to choose life. I want you to live a life of meaning and happiness and greatness. My friends, that doesn't happen unless you and I choose it. <clears throat> if we don't see it as an imperative, the tetzaveh, the commandment to grow and to build, we're settling for second best. Hashem doesn't want us to settle. He wants your neshama to be brilliant and bright and glimmer like a diamond in the sky. And the only way diamonds are born is through lots of pressure over lots of time. Don't allow yourselves to feel overwhelmed and helpless, despondent, don't don't give up. Never surrender. Always believe that there's potential for greatness as we as Jews know more than anyone else on the planet. If we don't have hope, there's no future. My bracha to each of us is that we walk away from this week's pasha and the inspiration that we had from this week's hopefully uh, Pasha class, we walk away with the recognition that the, there's infinite potential waiting for us, waiting for us to, un, to unleash it. And it's just up to us. I'm not saying go through the craziness. Pick something, a vision of what it means to be the best version of yourselves and say, Hashem, help me get there. Forget about it if you don't even know. But you can't move anywhere if you don't have a ratzon. You need to have a ratzon. You need to have a will. Don't give in to this old idea that things don't change. It's not true. People can gain all haba in an instant. You can have all of eternity in an instant. But if you're here right now, it means you have a, spe- a very special purpose that only you can accomplish. And it comes from you choosing to lean into the challenge. Lean into the challenge, crush it, and turn it into light. May we always be blessed and share in smachot, everyone. Shabbat shalom and barakah, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Shabbat.